we wouldn't make a dent in my in my hard drive. But I won't keep you here for twenty four hours. We'll go. We'll go until um, until I'm kidding. We're probably just about an hour, forty five minutes. It, it 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 all depends. Okay, but so we we are live, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, three minutes early. This is episode number one hundred and fifty five of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, and this is with. Uh, my good old friend Kevin Seaman, who was just telling me that he thinks that we've known each other for about 35 years. Um, if you guys are not familiar with Kevin, I, I, I actually have to apologize to you. Do you remember that you were Jeet Kune Do Dialogues episode number three? I do. And we, we had a, a lot of um, technical issues. Man. Well, we're much better. We're much more professional now, aren't we? I would certainly <laughs> <Right>? hope so. <laughs> yeah. So, so my apologies to uh, Sifu Kevin. It, this is a way, way overdue repeat performance from episode three to episode one hundred and fifty-five. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. But good to see you again, buddy. How are you? Fantastic. I'm so honored to have to be here with you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Well, it it you are one of my heroes. Um, I, I've you know you have what I call prodigious output, and you're still skinny, and I hate that because I'm fat, you know, <laughs> right? And is that just due to your level of of activity it over is. all these years? It is. It's a level of activity. And also, of course, I, I watch. I watch what I do. I, I watch my diet. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by diet is I don't cut back on foods, but I eat the right kinds of foods and try to stay, you know, really up on my nutrition. Okay. Um, you so know, when you're, you're like a big there, supplement guy? I do some supplements, yeah. Um, one of the tricks that I do is when I'm teaching, I can't really eat while I'm mm -hmm. teaching, and I'll teach. Uh, five or six hours straight. Cool. Uh, I, yeah, because of teaching at the university, especially, I have uh, 15 minutes between classes. Right. Sometimes a half an hour, usually 15 minutes. So I'll teach from like nine to two, you know, or something like that, straight through. And mm -hmm. so I'll just uh, sip BCAAs uh, with some, you know, uh, good strong electrolytes in there. And that's about it, you know, because I can't really eat. Yeah, after I'm done. And All right, my nine, constitution anyway. <laughs> okay, so nine nine to two is that five days a week? Uh, currently, what I've done is I've kind of compressed it into three days a week. Okay, and Cornell, uh, due to the COVID situation, yeah. uh, they although they allowed me to uh, at Cornell University, although they allowed me to teach in person, uh, they test me twice a week. Wow. Yeah, and they cut down a bunch of my stuff. Like they kicked my BJJ class out, obviously, right. yeah. my poly class, anything that was close quarter. Um, and so I'm basically teaching boxing, Muay Thai, and Jeet Kune Do. Okay. Hey, how do how how are um, private Jeet Kune Do concerns? Uh, how how are Jeet Kune, not Jeet Kune Do BJJ schools doing? in the COVID situation? I think it, it varies on the school. Mm -hmm. I know in New York, um, we've got some pretty strong restrictions. Yeah. Uh, at Tai Kai, where I teach uh, Muay Thai, uh, they just use dummies. So they have throwing dummies and they have grappling dummies. Okay. Um, and my Muay Thai class has gotten to the point where it's basically just a heavy bag class. And I have them so we can't hold pads, we can't clinch, we can't do any of that stuff, which is really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, but as teachers, it's our job to innovate. Ah. Right? Maybe. It's our job to be able to reach anyone. Yeah. See, not enough people have that attitude, you know, Kevin, as instructors. Not enough people have that attitude. And it distresses the heck out of me. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's... Our job is to to educate. So right. any method that we can use, whether it be verbal, visual, kinesthetic, you know, some of those things are taken away, we mm -hmm. still have to be able to be effective at mm -hmm. what we do. Yeah. Um, all right. So I I want to pull something up to here and um, ask you a question about it. Let me just find it. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> okay. So here's what I want. Here's what I want you to tell me. Yes. I lost the audio on you. So that is Francis Fong on the left, Sifu Dan and Asanto, and Ajahn Chai Surasut. Those are my three major instructors along with Eric Paulson and my Jiu Jitsu instructor. Uh, this was done at my Northeast Martial Arts Conference and Training Camp. Um, and that was in uh, the Finger Lakes region for seven years. And then the last year I did it at my school, which I had a huge, uh, like 4,000 square foot, actually it was almost 6,000 square foot school and with a full boxing ring, everything in the back. And that's where we had our last one. And that went up to right around 2000. Um, and Dwight, are you there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm still okay. there, right? I'm still there. I'm, I'm showing. I'm showing off the technology. See, awesome. right? Yeah, but so the que the question is, your loyalty to them mm -hmm. over what close to forty years? What is it about them? What is it about you that engenders that level of loyalty? Wow, that is a deep question. Um, well, it, as far as my loyalty to them, they are all three, and including Mr. Paulson, just phenomenal teachers and technicians. They have such a tremendous treasure of knowledge uh, among the three of them that I don't think I could ever, you know, uh, finish what they have to teach because they're constantly learning as well. As you know, you know all three of them. Mm -hmm. um, as far as loyalty goes, that's just kind of how I am. I'm, I'm kind of old school in that way. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that I won't train with other people, but I certainly um, put all my efforts into learning from them as much as, as, as often as I can. Yeah. That's a great picture of, of Eric. Uh, yeah, 1999. That was at my school. There's a boxing ring in the back. And uh man that was when he was fighting in japan wow and let me tell you something it was no pleasure to spar with him <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah. yeah what a character huh yeah okay so i'm gonna try to i'm, I'm gonna try to do something again okay i like oh, that beautiful Hi. yeah so I had to literally force him to take this picture. We were having a uh, dinosaur barbecue. That's a local barbecue joint uh, in Syracuse. We were having dinosaur barbecue and I, I asked him, hey man, can, you, uh, can we recreate this picture? And he goes, oh, oh, oh. So that's on the back deck. The, the one on the right there is on the back deck of my house. And of course the one on the left is, uh, at my school in 1999. But the one on the back deck was last year. I believe it was last year. I don't know. <laughs> well, okay, so that covers your, would you say that covers the base elements of your methodology then? Yes, sir. Right, CSW, Wing Chun, Muay Thai and Kali. Um, people are always looking for definitions of everyone's personal Jeet Kune Do, right? Mm -hmm. So would you, I'm devil's advocate in here. Would you say then that Wing Chun, Muay Thai, Kali, and CSW, those four get combined into an element that becomes your Jeet Kune Do? That's a terrible question, Dwight. You worded it <laughs> so ridiculously. <laughs> well, you missed a couple of elements. That's why I was going home. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm very much a boxing advocate. Yeah. And uh, I started boxing back when I did, right after I started uh, traditional Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. Back in 1975, I started boxing. 
actually it was earlier than that. It was 73 and then 75, I had another coach. And I used to travel down to Los Angeles to the Main Street Boxing Gym on Central Ave in South Central. Right. And I'd box. And I love boxing. I love the training. I love the methodology. To me, it's, you know, it, it, you get instant feedback. Uh -huh. That's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't have a good defense, if you don't know how to use your footwork appropriately, if you can't apply counter offensive techniques, you find out right away. I mean, there's no, there's no holes. You don't get benched, you get punched. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's why I love boxing. And it's uh, also, I believe that if you take any martial art and, you know, jujitsu has done this, uh, Muay Thai obviously did this way before uh, Western boxing, but if you put it into the training method of, you know, three or four minute rounds with a one minute rest, and you train your whole period like that, you're gonna get better. Mm -hmm. You have to, mm -hmm. by fruition, because the work ethic has to be there in order to be able to do that. Um, going to the boxing gym quite frequently, I'd walk out of there, it'd be two and a half hours. Yeah. That's a three minute on, one minute rest, three minute on, one minute rest. And I never did some anything as hard as that in my whole life. Not even, you know, not even football practice, doing doubles in the summer. That was hard. So you're saying you have you done you've done that, let's say, with like stick work as well. Go round. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And uh, and that's why I love jujitsu is because, uh, yeah, you can you can just roll. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll just go to my my friend's house and we'll just roll for you know an hour mm -hmm. until he's so tired that I can finally take advantage of him. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, all, all joking aside, um, I think if you put that methodology in anything, even in yeah. weight training, you're going to get better and you're going to be more efficient. When I used to train some of the guys in uh, pro MMA and amateur and stuff, I used to take them to the gym and I would say, okay, you're going to do uh, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. So if it's a five minute round, you're going to do five exercises, one minute each, okay? And then I'm gonna give you a, a one or two minute rest. And mm -hmm. you're gonna do three sets today. And they'd look at me like, okay, then what? I go, then we'll do abs and you know, you're done. And they're like, what? Yeah. And then when they did it, they were like, holy shit. Yeah. This is hard. Yeah. Because it's completely different. I could say you take uh, just, the, just the Olympic bar and you do uh, some cleans, some good mornings, some um, uh, some um, rows, some vertical rows, um, some deadlifts, you know, and just take five exercises that you can pop off with a 35 pound bar. You'd be so shocked how hard it is. Mm -hmm. But that set them into the pace for five minute rounds, also for their fights. Okay. And the strength training, you know, kept them, it really gave them that muscular endurance that I was right. looking for and that, that ability. Where did that um, level of creativity and innovativeness come from in you? Where did that come from? Dan and Asano. Really? 100%. Dan and Asano. Dan and Asano is, I, I, without any stretch of the imagination, the most brilliant man I've ever met in my life. Wow. Hmm. And I constantly, because he used to do that, you know. You know, uh, you know what's funny? When you talked about rounds of it, I heard Cass Magda saying, yeah, well, Dan and I, we used to do rounds of uh, Sombrata. Yeah. I heard, I, I, I recall hearing him say that. Well, he literally runs every seminar like that. <laughs> and has since you and I have been going to <laughs> yeah 35 whatever years yeah. ago you know I got I got to include something else here so I identify you totally <laughs> with New York but you're actually Californian yes yeah, so I, I, yeah I'm from California I was born in Los Angeles yeah and do people know this and then I was there and uh I came back here in the late seventies. And the reason I did was, uh, I had a failed business. Uh, 
I, I started my first restaurant at age 23 and we were doing great, but I was so naive that I didn't, you know, I, I felt, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. And then I'm like, what do you mean I have to get out? Mm -hmm. I have a lease. And they're like, we're not talking to you anymore here. Contact our attorney. <laughs> wow. And I basically got force, forcibly evicted and I lost. So when I came to New York, I was not only uh, homeless <laughs> and penniless, but I was $40,000 in debt. Yeah. I lost everything. I lost my, all, my entire, uh, savings you know and, and everything my investment and time and energy and of course capital yeah so i had to start from the beginning um which you know that's the beauty if it's all up here you can go anywhere in the world right and have nothing to declare and start over right that's the mindset that i you know i i i had forgotten i had forgotten about your um previous life as a restaurateur um being in new york it must be killing you what's happening to the restaurant industry in that state yes oh my god you know you guys can move to florida you know <laughs> we, 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 ron, DeSantis, ron DeSantis does not fool around <laughs> okay well you probably you know one of the things that i do is uh i i cook at home a lot you know, I make up recipes and I bake. I was a pastry chef and I was a full chef for many, many years. So mm -hmm. I like to put my stuff on Facebook. So I have like, you know, hundreds of photos of food right. <laughs> <laughs> and different things that I've done. You know? Yeah. yeah. That, that um, episode of your life, being $40,000 in debt, um, being, being out of work and what have you, that's what led to mindset development, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Once I hit rock bottom, I, I kind of looked at it and I and said, took a really harsh look at myself and said, you know, where are my standards at right now? What do mm -hmm. I need to do to get back to where I, and uh, where I was before and beyond yeah. and meet my potential. And more importantly, who's done this before that I can learn from? Right. I would, yeah. I would, see, that's what I, that's what I wanted to know. Where was martial art? What role was martial art playing at that time? Oh, completely. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of people go, wow, that was so tragic that that happened to you. And I, I thought it was the best thing that ever happened to me um, in retrospect, because what it did is it made me took away all this, um, you know, California is much like Florida. There's an awful lot of diversion there. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it took yes. away all that diversion. And I right. lived in a farmhouse uh, on a 800-acre farm and worked in the barn and then worked at, for three twenty dollars an hour um, doing basic cooking. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to build myself back up. And so martial arts was a huge part of that because that's what, always, what I always reclused back to yeah. for my strength, Yeah, you know, my spiritual strength. So that's the one thing you never let go of. I never let go. But now, what? So, but were you in boxing and traditional kung fu in that time? Oh yeah, yeah. I learned. I met uh, Dan and Asano in 1975 ah. from my boxing coach. Uh, he also introduced me, but I never met him in person to Ajahn Chai. Really. Yeah, because when I first met Ajahn Chai, I have a really great story about this. It was at the Smoky Mountain Camp, uh -huh. 1986, and I really wanted to talk to him alone. And I saw him up by the plane. There was this airplane sitting out there, and we worked out in an airplane hangar at the Smoky Mountain Camp. And he's sitting up there, and he's walking around in his tie shorts, and he just got done, like, completely killing us. And I came up, and I go, and I didn't know very much about, you know, Thai boxing or the, you know, the etiquette. And I kind of went like this and I go, are you a uh, high master Chai? Uh, and he goes, I go, are you your master Chai, right? He kind of looked at me and I go, and he goes, who want to know? <laughs> and I said, uh, my name's Kevin Seaman. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
And um, he goes, okay. And I said, I trained with uh, Bill Burke. And he goes, really? I knocked him out. What'd you think about that? And I go, oh. <laughs> thank you. You broke my nose. <laughs> and he laughed and, you know, but for a, for a split second there, he looked at me like I was lunch. <laughs> you know, I got this feeling that you only get when you look, you know, go, you go to the zoo and you look in the tiger's eye, right. you know, and you, yeah. you go, whoa, uh, my mortality is very fragile right now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the reason I started training with Ajahn Chai, I really appreciated Muay Thai. I mean, I, being in California in Los Angeles, there was actually fights on the black and white TV back in the day. They had bull fights, they had Muay Thai fights, they had all kinds of international stuff. Yeah. So I watched it every once in a while, um, but didn't really understand it. And I tried to get this one bartender to teach me Muay Thai, and he just ended up kicking me in the leg a few times and then told me to get lost, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I really, I really appreciate it, but what really sold me was the first time I trained with Ajahn Chai, he worked me so hard and all of us so hard that I, I felt like, man, I've got a lot, of, I've got something missing in my life and this is yeah. it. Wow, wow, that's interesting. I, needed, I, I thought I was, a, you know, in good shape. I thought I was, you know, kind of a badass and he woke me right up. Yeah, yeah. You know, and taught me that, hey, you got a long way to go, son. And that was, I was right around 30, a little bit over 30 years old at the time when I first started Muay Thai. The, um, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to work, I'm trying to work it out in, in my head. Cause I never went to, to Smoky Mountain. I met him in, um, 85 mm. and the, which was the last year of CMAA in St. Louis. And then Vic Payne took over with with um, with uh, Smoky Mountain, which I, I the idea of camping just didn't do it for me. So that's yeah. why I, I I know. So you did you and I meet then? When did the Northeast Conference start? Ninety two. Oh, was like I think it was not um, ninety. Might have been ninety actually. Nineteen ninety. Okay. And yeah. which came first, Northeast Conference or Southeast Conference? Northeast. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then, um, Sifu Francis patterned Southeast Conference off what you had been doing up there. Yes. Yes. Mm. Uh, no, I thought that was awesome. That was such a huge honor. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I met you in New York. Oh. At New Hollis seminar. Oh. That okay. was the first time I met you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you know, when you've been at it this long, some stuff just flies out of your head. But I really enjoy when I when I talk to somebody like you, and you will have a memory of something, and I'll be like, "What? I was there. I did that. I said that." And I'm like, "I have no idea what you're talking about." <laughs> you, you know. Um, so I wanted to show everybody this because because I'm not sure if everybody is aware of oh, um, thank you of, of this right. So. Here's my first question about this. Two of them are, for lack of a different expression, two of them are instructional, right? Yes. Sun Fan Gung Fu, volumes one and volume two. The other three are all mindset, internal, to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't have number six, um, <laughs> um, how to hack your mind. Well, that's good because it hasn't been released yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right. I want to take a second just to say uh, thank you to everybody that's watching. Um, I see a bunch of my students there and one of them from Germany. Uh, some people that I, I mean, met, Mitz Bandiera, I met down in uh, at the Smoky Mountains camp and just recently have reconnected with him. You know, Terry Valor, there's a bunch of really fantastic martial arts. Richard Torres, fantastic martial artists on here. And I'm so uh, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's watching. Yeah, 
I, I ignore the comments because I get distracted. I'm <laughs> well, that's, you might have seen my eyes yeah. <laughs> starting back there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get distracted by, by that stuff. And, um, you know, when you're afflicted like I am, you got to focus, which was another one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. Yes, because um, has there been a study done on the percentage of people who say they want to achieve something and do nothing whatsoever or say they want to achieve something um start out become disappointed in their results and stop versus the percentage of people who say they want to do something and actually end up doing it there are quite a few studies um one of the ones that comes to mind was from harvard university and they took one of the classes and they they had everybody write down uh, after at, at the reunion what they'd accomplished and if they had goals when they were in the university. Right. And only 3% of the people had goals and clear written goals when they were in the, that same class in the university. And those three had achieved more than the entire class combined. <laughs> right. Which is a pretty, pretty, pretty solid statement. Yeah, um, I'm very big on, on writing notes. I always have been. I have, you know, stacks and stacks of notes of uh, martial arts, um, personal development, and of course, mental performance uh, from people that are out there that are just, some of them are no longer with us, you know, and, and that's valuable information. And that, right. you know, to me, something really interesting happens when you write. And a lot of people now, of course, you know, they type on their computer, but Writing is a physio neurological um, activity. And what that does is it makes you retain because you have to retain as you're thinking about it prior, as you're doing it, and, and also after you've done it. And then usually you're gonna go back and look at it again. Mm -hmm. So yep. you know, it really drives it into your subconscious and you, I, I think your retention is far greater what about reading an actual book versus reading um, electronically? That I, I'm not sure about the data. Um, I know that people learn on different levels. Some people are more auditory. Some people are more visual. And some people are more kinesthetic. Yeah. For me to really get something, I need to do it. I mean, I can hear it and I can see it. But when I do it and I feel it and I feel the energy, then I, I really get it was it easy for you to see in asano or francis fong or ajahn chai or or um eric paulson do something and then you could you could like again for lack of a different expression copy it almost immediately man you have got that's a that's a tough question i'm going to tell you first of all nothing with any of those individuals has ever been easy <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, I am a very slow learner. I really, really? yes, sir. I'm, I'm dyslexic. So I have to constantly work at those things and I'm a very slow learner. So I have to do it over and over and over and over and over until I really get it. I am not one of those gifted people that can just see it and do it. You're not a Neil uh, Caliph. Yeah, there's so many out there, you know, yeah. uh, yeah, I can name uh, Burton Richardson's another one. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, well, there's Paulson so himself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes, and I think Rodan too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's because they're all um, disordered. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> right. It um. It's, it's actually, when I use the term disordered, it's a term of affection. Oh, okay. Right, because- I have so much fun with you. <laughs> <laughs> right, because, so for example, I have never been dyslexic myself as far as I know, but whenever I come across people who, um, let's call it suffer from it, like I turn it into a joke. I go, well, no, you're not, you're dyslexic, right? <laughs> so just, just so they don't focus on this thing that they think is presented a problem for them. What's been your technique, knowing 
what your afflictions are. But in the role of a, a teacher, what's been your technique in um, helping people to get beyond certain points? Well, one of the things is being highly organized. Mm. Um, I've had to do that to learn, so therefore I had to do that to teach. And I like progression. So um, one of the things that I'll do even today with my classes, I'll teach individual techniques and then I'll put them into a progression at the end. And we'll do like two or three rounds at the end of the class with those techniques mm -hmm. all you know, combined uh, sometimes into uh, a workout. And I'll make them do a couple of rounds. In Muay Thai, I do that all the time. Yeah, I'll take those components, I'll work on them individually, and then we'll put them together. Um, so you have you ever gone into a class with no lesson plan? Pretty much every day. I go in with a with a sense of where the class is. Ah. Because you don't know who's going to show up to the class. Okay. And if I'm say, oh, this is my lesson plan, and then I come into class and I have you know, 70% of them are beginners, mm -hmm. it's really not going to work well with them. They're not gonna retain. Right. For me, it's always been about results. You know, I, I like to be a results-oriented person. And so if I'm teaching and you're not getting it, I'm not getting the result. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing something wrong. In other words, I'm ineffectual as a teacher. So I have to look at the group and I have to teach or speak as the group mandates. Right. So, and the same thing, if I have a certain idea that I'm going to do something and um, they're all advanced guys, they're going to be like, man, we are bored. So you have to look and, and adjust depending on who's there. Okay. So so your your classes are not divided up into levels? No. No, they're not. Uh, at, at the university, I have um, beginning boxing, I have intermediate boxing like that, you know, but most of my classes are not divided into levels. I've always felt that you, you are a good teacher. You, you should be able to teach on all levels, right? but you have to expand. It. And if I have like two or three, um, say I have 20 students and two or three of them are advanced, I'll give them something more yeah. to work on. Yeah, I'll expand on what we're doing. How do, how do you deal then with the idea that an advanced technique or a so-called advanced technique is really just the basic technique but done at a higher level of proficiency? How does that factor then into your, your approach to teaching? Well, absolutely. You just said it. it it's the application of that technique that's mm -hmm. advanced. You know, it's one thing to, to be able to throw a round kick you know, it's another thing to be able to throw a round kick at someone who's trying to punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. and it's another thing to be able to throw a round kick at somebody who's had like 100 fights and is trying to punch you in the face. Mm -hmm. um, I always, this is a kind of a cool analogy, and I throw this out to my students a lot. Um, I'll say, okay, I'm, who's really good at basketball? And someone will obviously will raise their hand, you know. And I'll say, okay, so how many free throws can you take? Can you make? And oh, you oh, you know, out of ten, you make six out of ten. You're sixty percent. You can do seventy-seven out of ten. That's college level. That's excellent. If you're a seventy percent free thrower, you're scholarship material. Okay. And I go and, and I go, oh yeah, maybe you know. And I go, what if the basket was doing this? How many could you make? And they go none. So that's why you need. To that's why you need to be in shape in order to be able to move. So you're not there. Right. You can't sit there and wait for something. You have to move. You have to be. And that's what JKD, in my opinion, that's what JKD is about. It's about being proactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's it's about being first. That uh, that puts me in mind of I just saw your your. Um, Z, what you call Z footwork uh, video. Oh, the Z, the Z stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just, I just, I just saw that. And you know, you know, when I saw that, I go, okay, so 
the way my brain works, I see that and I start thinking about Phil Norman's ghost. Okay, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with his stuff. I know he's he's from uh, from Great Britain, right? Yeah. From Norman? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've never really met him, um, but he's on my radar, definitely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's all about. I don't want to speak for him, but a lot of it to me is about not being there, never being a target, always mm -hmm. being on on the move, and being able to hit from being able to hit from in from angles from wherever you are. Absolutely. And, right. You know, and which now. Here's something that I want to throw your way based on what we just talked about. Rick Fay, our esteemed colleague, right? Love that guy. Fantastic. Rick Fay said yeah. once about Muay Thai. Muay Thai is essentially this. They, stand, they, they get in range and they throw bombs. Right? Now, but is there a new Muay Thai that's working on angling and mobility and what have you? Well, here's my take on that. Okay, in Thailand, why do people go to the Muay Thai fights? To gamble? Yes. So why wouldn't you stand right in front of your opponent and make that the odds change and, you know, really make people get excited and bet? But you, if you watch the people that are really good, that already have the odds in their favor, like Senchai, uh, Oka, those guys don't stand in front and throw bombs. Mm. They? They're moving around, they're cutting angles, they're doing stuff that people go, whoa, wow, that's so innovative. But I think to me, that's because they don't care, because the odds are already in their favor. I see, I see. So whoever's betting already knows what, what they're betting on. Yeah. You know, and, and I, that's an unfortunate part about Muay Thai. You know? And, but I think, I, I feel that, and you'll see the same thing in boxing, you'll see guys that will stand there and bang, you know, but the problem with that is you take too much damage and, you know, somebody's going to get knocked out. Right. You sit there and you just throw bombs. Yeah. Did you know? Like, uh, like, uh, yeah. I, I like the, I like the approach that, you know, uh, fighters like Ali, um, Sanchenko is, is a newer fighter, fantastic fighter. You know, and, and you know, you've done enough sparring that you know that one of the worst things that can happen to you is you, for you to think you're going to hit somebody and miss. <laughs> because then you're like, oh, where are they? You know? right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought in terms of what's one thing that you came that you discovered from your own martial art adventure and you realized that nobody else was doing it that nobody had put it into what they were doing have you ever had that wow um that's that's an interesting question. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold that. Okay. And and, and I'm, I'll answer that later. But I need to I need to process that a little. Okay. Bit. All right. Well, let me let me ask you this: If somebody said, "Okay, Kevin Seaman, you've been teaching for many years. You've taught tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of people. Give us the basic structure behind your approach." To right, especially since you talked about mm -hmm. being progressive, so they, they go, Okay, give me the basic structure. Do you have an answer for that? Yes, uh, most importantly, is, is strong foundational basics, mm -hmm. and, and I think that those are glossed over so much. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, maybe it's the new mindset of just the individuals that are studying martial arts that. You know, they, they have a very, um, very ADD generation right now. And it's like, well, you mean I have to do this over and over and over? Yeah. And over and over and over and over right. until you're sick and tired of it, until you can't stand it. Right. And you, 
Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, and that's like saying, hey, coach, I'm not going to do uh, free throws today. I got it. You know, who would ever do that? They, they, they would get cut from the team. Right. You have to constantly, because, you know, all this stuff is perishable. Mm -hmm. They're perishable skills. You may still have it up here, but your body can't emulate what your mind has, you know, developed unless you're in shape. Yeah. That was the whole thing, I think, with Bruce Lee. And this is why I've always tried to stay in really good shape. Yeah. Um, what constitutes solid foundational or fundamental uh, training? Uh, so if you get rattled, you don't you don't fly off and you know, ad lib. You go right back to your basics. Okay. Right. If you yeah. know how to, if that's that's really the, I think that's really the the testing ground is something happens. What do you do? You know, when stuff hits the fan. What do you do? Yeah. Do you do you cover? Do you start throwing bombs? Do you try to tackle the person, or do you go right back to what you know? Um, I think composure and um. Boys <laughs> is what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, what do you think of the phrase, put the fun back into fundamentals? I like that. <laughs> I like that. It's wonderful. I, I hate it. <laughs> now, I want to I want to tell you something that uh, has been on before I forget. Um, you know, one of the things about, about the whole footwork thing and with Bruce Lee, like, I think that... You know, people are still amazed at how intuitive he was. And Dan Inasano taught me something a long time ago about, uh, you, you probably know this, and a lot of the Jeet Kune Do guys know this, but he said Bruce Lee used to measure people by their leg length. So he would look at their leg, and, and then he would transpose that visually on the floor, and then he'd take a little bit of a step back. So all he had to do was calculate their step in, in order to stay out of distance or to close distance. Mm -hmm. And I always like that, and I, I constantly teach that. I not, not only do I teach it in Jeet Kune Do, but I teach it in boxing, in, in Muay Thai. Yeah, and it works phenomenally well. Yeah, they have to move to reach me. Right. I think he even said that in one of the one of the shows. Oh yeah, in the in the long in the long street thing. The yeah, you have to move first. Yeah. Then I can intercept. Huh? That's that's, that's my cool. that's sort of my approach right. to all those arts. You know, personally. Okay. Yeah, I discovered a thing through through Kali more so than anything else, where I play around with what my back foot does mm -hmm. because that changes my my distance in relation to where my opponent is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change my distance in relation to where I am. You see, and it's just because I'm moving my back foot, but my front foot doesn't go anywhere. So, so even though it looks like I'm further away from him, I'm still uh, where I need to be in relation to him. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you snap back, you can still you can still reach him. Yeah. 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 Oh no, that's totally. What did um, you started, Kali? within Asano in what year? I, I started, um, well, as I said, I met uh, Guru. I started in 1984 with him. I met Guru in 1975, and my that boxing coach that introduced me to Guru at the Torrance Academy, we were going down to the Main Street Boxing Gym, and that's where I met him. He didn't have a car, so I, we took my Volkswagen Bug <laughs> to drive down to from Santa Barbara to, to Los Angeles. Yeah. We'd go like a couple, two, three times a week. Yeah. And he introduced me to Guru at that time. I filled out an application. I gave it to Richard, Richard Bastillo. And um, later I go, why didn't you call me? Richard goes, what? I go, I filled out an application back. He goes, when was that? And I told him, he goes, oh, I probably threw it away. <laughs> I said, see, I would have been, I would have been going to the academy then. Right. You know? But that was when they had the circles on the floor yeah. in the college academy, you know, and um, everybody was 
would train right in the circle, and uh, I remember that very well. But Bill Burke was the first one to teach me Filipino martial arts, and that was in 1975 when I met him. And he trained with Angel Cabalas and um, uh, Grandmaster Padoy, okay. the Duropio system. Yeah. Uh, and he introduced me to uh, those elements, and I just loved it. I didn't even know there was a Filipino martial art uh. at that time period. You know, and um, he was a karate black belt. He was a U.S. collegiate champion in Shotokan. And so he introduced me to a bunch of people in the Shotokan, Nishiyama, and a bunch of those people. Yeah. Although I never did study karate. When was your first stick fighting competition? Oh, I, can't, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, it was... I'm going to say it was probably in the early 90s or okay. late 80s. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe the, reason, the, reason why I'm asking, the reason why I'm asking is because, um, you know, if we, if we look at these, if we look at your tomes, winning mindset is the life mindset. But Correct. the other two are about competition. Correct. Right? So I, I, I wanted to ask you that about how long after you started did you start competing? And if you, yeah. if you had a specific reason for competing, as in, well, this is how I'll test what I'm really able to do or, or whatever, or was it just... Oh, there's a competition? Oh, I'll go. Yeah, I think it was more about um, just getting the work in. Because in boxing, that's how I was always taught. My coaches were always like, you got to get the work in. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't like, and I remember losing, I lost my first fight, you know, and, and I was all bummed out. And the coach is like, stop being a punk. You got the work in, didn't you? And I'm like, yeah, but I lost. And he's like, who cares? Right. Did you really lose? I mean, did you learn anything? And I go, well, yeah, I remember this plain as day. And so it was always about getting the work in, you know, and, and that's how you're going to eventually get better and better and better. And then you're going to, you're going to win. Right. And I kind of, I, I've also expressed that to all my students. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that because you mentioned the ADD generation, yeah. right? Um, how do you pass that on to them? That it's the, the out. Yes, the outcome's important, right? Mm -hmm. But also, the way you participate is just as important, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And experience is is a great teacher, right? And you know, the, you, you can't buy that. And the yeah. other thing that's very very important is how you handle uh, failure and rejection. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, do you give up? Right. Or do you make you stronger? Yeah. Participation trophies, Kevin. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hold you responsible for all of this. Where did it go wrong? I, I got to tell you, that's, I can't stand participation trophies. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I remember in the, in, in, when we would do kickboxing, I used to be a... Uh, a promoter and I do kickboxing, I do, do Muay Thai fights. And, um, when they first told me I had to have a participant trophy, they go, well, you have to have a winner and a participant. I go, why? And the guy looked at me and he's like, are you serious? Right. Well, the guy got out there and he did his best. Yeah, but he didn't win. <laughs> there's a winner and then there's the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was always my mindset. And that didn't necessarily mean that I'm um looking down on that person or judging them but right why do they need a trophy do you know how many of those i found in the garbage <laughs> people would walk out and throw them right in the trash <laughs> <laughs> because they were so upset you know they got right. every time they looked at that it said participant on <laughs> oh, that, that. Oh, yeah man. i just like comp the competition because i like to get in there and, and mix it up with people and that's always been my thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that uh, I really, really, one of the worst things about this COVID 
pandemic for me personally is my lack of being able to interact on a physical level with people. I can handle all the other stuff. Right, right. You know, wearing a mask is no big deal. I mean, you know, so what? Yeah. Um, and but and getting tested is no big deal to me. I mean, I got tested at Cornell twice a week when I was teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, it's about that physical contact because that's where the real, that's where the genius is. That's where you learn. That's where you really, you need that, right. that interactive because there's nothing that can, nothing that can substitute for that. Yeah. You well, know, so I had my sights on going to the worlds, the to worlds in Las Vegas this August. Uh, and I was going to win it. <laughs> And I say that with, you know, because I did the work and I, that's my mindset, yeah. but I don't want people to think, oh, wow, this guy's so arrogant. He thinks he's going to win. But uh, also remember that it's for a specific age group. Yeah. So I, every yeah. jiu-jitsu tournament I've ever participated in has been against 30-year-olds. Uh, I've gone to tournaments where I participated. I've been in the 30 and, I've been in the 30 and up or 30 and under rather. And... Um, 200 pound and I cut weight for it. <laughs> so to actually be able to, you know, participate in a competition where I'm with people my own age and my own peer group, I, I yeah. just think uh, it would be fantastic. Well, if anybody ever complained to me, oh, who's Kevin uh, Seaman think he is uh, talking about winning that way? I'd be like, well, he wrote the book. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, right. What did you write? If you, if you've written, but, and I have to tell you this, right? I have to tell you this. Um, I don't know who wrote the copy for the Winning Mindset website, but it is inspiring as hell. Oh, that that was me. Thank you. Oh, it's it's awesome. I mean, I think people, if if, if you guys who hear this, you should go and just read that front page of the website. Even if you don't buy the book, of course you should buy the book and you can do the exercises. But let's say, right, that you're not that driven. Just read the copy on that front page. And that could inspire you for like a week. You've done the homework. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here, here's, here's my secret. I make it look easy. You do. <laughs> that, that that's the true sign of a professional. Well, thank you. Right. You know, I, an, an interesting thing about Jeet Kune Do, and I, I I don't want to get too far off the subject, is that uh, it, it's really once you understand, you know, what Jeet Kune Do is really about. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard for it not to infiltrate impartiality in just about everything you do. Well, right. You Which know, is why I have said that people who get it end up becoming Jeet Kune Do. It's no longer something you take. You know, people, when they talk about martial art, oh, I, agree. I take this, I take that, you know, I, I practice this. It's not even something that you train anymore. It's just mm -hmm. what you are. I agree. You are, right? It's your mindset. It's your, it's your entire direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's your approach. I mean, I Jeet Kune Do things all the time. <laughs> and one of the one of the things that I just got done saying earlier was, uh, in my opinion, if I could put Jeet Kune Do into one, uh, I mean, there's a lot of words. There's efficiency. There's, you know, there's so many words I could use. But I think proactivity is really one of yeah. the main things that comes to mind. Yeah. You know, because Bruce really, I mean, even in the name, you know, in intercepting fist way, mm -hmm. he wanted to proactively hit. To mm -hmm. stop the attack, you know, yeah. it's all about that that counter offensive, and yeah. um, you know, so that goes into all of my. It goes into my jujitsu. It goes into my, uh, you know, and obviously I'm not hitting people in jujitsu, but I'm still utilizing different angles. Uh, a lot of the concepts or, or principles that I learned in Jeet Kune Do, right. I'm applying in Muay Thai. I'm applying, and I think that's what makes my Muay Thai a little bit different. But, but is that not also what makes it difficult? for people to get Jeet Kune Do, even Jeet Kune Do people to get it? Well, I think we're, we're very structured in our learning, mm -hmm. especially here in the United States. So 
unfortunately, you, you, you think that the mold is what you're supposed to be, that the mold and the, the end product are the same and they're not. Right. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's more of a growth process and uh, it, it certainly is about expression. I mean, I don't care who you are. If you're doing Jeet Kune Do, you're not doing everything that's involved in Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. And if you are, you're not doing all of it well. Mm -hmm. Because that's not the nature of Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. The nature of it is, you know, certain aspects of it, you're going to do very well. And certain aspects are not going to fit you. Right. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of it that I'm not going to do anymore because I don't have that that speed, I don't have that strength. So I have to use my mind yeah. instead. Yeah. You know, I, so, I've um, always made but that proactivity is really interesting. And the, and, and the timing, the angles, the simplicity, uh, economy of motion, that personal expression, those are all elements that of JKD that I integrate in all my martial arts. Hey, let's say that you agree with me that um, the purpose of, of uh, human life is to evolve physically, emotionally, mentally, and because of those three, uh, automatically somewhat spiritually. Mm -hmm. Let's say you agree with me that that's the purpose of life. Do you see Bruce Lee as being a role model for those four areas, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual? Well, I, I see the image of Bruce Lee being a model for that as far as, um, see the problem with academics and is that once you get involved in it, you need to prove everything and it has to be, uh, it can't be based on conjecture. There has to be science. And I've never met Bruce Lee. I tried to meet him. I was that old. <laughs> I actually drove down to Los Angeles, down to, to the Long Beach Nationals, which I had competed in before. Yeah. And I, I go, he's going to be there. I just know he is. And, and, he, and he wasn't, you know. Yeah. He had some, I think he might either been still in uh, shooting or something. I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to meet him. And, and my teacher was so upset with that, that the fact that I liked Bruce Lee because my teacher was from Hong Kong. And dig this, he was a Choi Lee Futt guy. <laughs> <laughs> and unless you really understand what I'm saying right here, you don't get the whole gist of it. Right, yeah. Lee Khan and Choi Lee Futt guys hated each other. You know, and they knew each other in Hong Kong because they were in, they were in gangs, you know. Yeah. And, used yeah. and he got sent, oh, my teacher got sent over here because he got in trouble and his dad was pretty well known and pretty, pretty rich. Mm -hmm. And he shipped him off to Catholic school. In the United States <laughs> with family. All right. So I am going to look at my notes because I have not asked you a single question that came off of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you're looking at your notes, I wanted to say something, you know, that I always find really interesting. You know, although JKD is not a sport, and I understand that, you know, but elements of JKD can definitely be applied. They can be applied uh, in the competitive arena, I've done it. I've had boxers, Bobby Gambetta, you know Bobby. Um, fantastic. I mean, he's a full instructor under under Sifu Inosano. Um, he is an Ajahn under Ajahn Chai. He's been with me the longest of any of my students. People don't know this, five-time Golden Glove State Champion. He was almost in the Olympics. 80 fights, he probably lost like six. Wow. He confused the hell out of everybody because he was a southpaw and I taught him JKD4. And he used JKD footwork in boxing. And just, he, we called him the ghost because you couldn't hit him in the face. You could only hit him in the body. He would be gone. Yeah. You know, it was like you're punching through an image. You guys yeah. definitely have to look at Phil Norman stuff then. I will. I yeah. will. Yeah. 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 He especially yeah. got me intrigued. Yeah. And then Andrew McCrory and my own son, uh, my adopted son, Eric uh, Charles. You know, those guys have all put JKD in, in the competitive arena, in the pro and amateur arena. And it's yeah. You know, I have to say, that's one, of, that's one of the many things I admire about you because you've seen those Facebook discussions about JKD and MMA and, and what mm -hmm. have you. And I like how you just dip your toe in it and you make one little comment and then you're gone. 
I'm really not into into arguing. With <laughs> you know, when you get to a certain uh, maturity, you're like, yeah, I, life's too precious for all, to spend all that time on that. Yeah. Um, but you know, the other thing that I find interesting is everybody will say, well, JKD is not a sport. You cannot use it in sports. Okay, I got to. But the same people will say, well, JKD is comprised of three elements. Wing Chun, boxing, and fencing. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm no PhD, but aren't boxing and fencing sports? <laughs> <laughs> and didn't Bruce Lee learn, you know, the footwork and then develop it by watching Muhammad Ali? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty well known. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and then it went back into boxing. And a lot of people don't know this, that... Uh, there was an interview with uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, and he said, they asked him, well, who's your mentor? And he goes, well, he's, some, he's this, like this kung fu cat. Like, people talked like that back then. And uh, that's where I learned the footwork. And his name is Bruce Lee. So it went from boxing to JKD to boxing, mm -hmm. and people don't even re really realize that. Yeah. it. Um, you know, the, ho the whole thing where I was talking to uh, – do you know Zane Isaacs? Do you know who that is? I don't. Okay, so Zane Zane's a guy who's been on here with me. Um, he runs an outfit called um, uh, Championship MMA. Okay. And uh, and and he and I talk. He and I talk uh, pretty often. And uh, I was telling him yesterday, I think it was, that in JKD there are those who went as far as they saw Bruce Lee go. And then to me, there are those who went in the direction of where they saw Bruce Lee headed. Mm -hmm. You see? So there are some who, when, when his life unfortunately got cut off, they stopped their own progression mm -hmm. and stuck to just what they got from him up until 73. But then there are other people who saw where he was going and they chose to keep going themselves. Does that make sense? It absolutely makes sense. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's, uh, that was a, a discussion here, a little discussion he and I were, were having. Because how, how concerned, if at all, are you about there not being, this was something that came up on Wednesday, about there not being a universally accepted or universally agreed upon definition of what jkd is how concerned are you well i i'm a student of human nature <laughs> so <laughs> i'm I, you know it's it's that's just how people are you know and if it's not defined for them then they will put their own definition on it and that definition can be varied and you know people are just not going to agree with it Mm -hmm. And that to me, that doesn't concern me. Um, I'm not somebody who's who's trying to control everybody else's opinion. Right. Uh, in fact, I think exactly the opposite. I think diversity is what makes us human mm -hmm. and is, is a beautiful thing about us. Mm -hmm. um, I love the fact that you and I are different and that other people are different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, fantastic. I mean... Uh, a good example is Richard Torres. I mean, very different, very competent, very, you know, an exceptional martial artist and a, a tremendous, uh, you, you know, uh, study in, in JKD. I mean, he's somebody I admire. Yeah. Well, we couldn't be too, we couldn't be any different, right. you know, but that makes, that's diversity. And that's what makes things so interesting. Yeah. And so wonderful. Yeah. I, 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 I um, have, adopted the, the idea that it is if you know there's this saying that diver our diversity is what makes us stronger but people but people think that it's skin color uh, or ethnic origin that's what they mean by diversity and yeah. to me that's ridiculous because as bruce lee said to paraphrase bruce lee everybody's got the same basic anatomical structure so yeah. that's, that's, not a, that's, a very, that's a very narrow perspective yeah, that's not diverse at all but it is the diversity of thought, mm -hmm. you see? So me, you, R Richard Torres, you and I, they could say, well, those two are concepts, guys, 
and Richard is whatever, whatever. But we both have respect for him. Yeah. You see, you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Right. And then when you look at the two of us being uh, the spawn of Fong, Sirisu, Inasano, and Paulson, you and I are still different from each other. Yes. You, you know, but then when we have a conversation about the mind, we start going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. That's the strength. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we all have been raised and and have had, you know, various influences throughout our life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's no way that we could be the same, that anybody could be the same. So to, th this this thing that human beings want to do to put everything in a nice package. Yeah. I find amusing. Yeah. You know, and when, you know, and I, you know, people uh, that start to get all upset about this stuff and they, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, I don't even like to use the concepts and original and whatever, mm -hmm. because in my opinion, there's really only one JKE. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just various expressions of it. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you're doing JKD. Now, if you're doing something else and you're not doing JKD and you're calling it that, that's just wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, um, if I'm cooking dirt, I'm not a chef. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have to cook food yeah. in order for it to be a, for me to be a chef. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't get hung up on that stuff, you know, and, and, when people, um, I was talking to my wife, Donna, the other day, and she said something about, um, you know, people, I guess, um, judging you or, you know, saying things or putting you down or saying things about you, you know, and I said, I don't even worry about that stuff. I, I could care less. In fact, I kind of like what P.T. Barnum said. You know, say, say negative things, say positive things, but make sure you spell my name right. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times people get so mad because I, I, I make I, jokes about it. They're like, oh, he's not even serious. <laughs> right. Okay. And for those of you who might not know, that's a literal concern of yours. <laughs> that's right. right? <laughs> Show that magazine. <laughs> well, right? This magazine... <laughs> as my name spelled correctly but the original one did not and this is a, a magazine that both Dwight and I um, among other people were asked to participate in and I thought it was fantastic I I love getting my stuff out there and I love reading everybody else and you know their, their expressions and their you know their work I think it's phenomenal yep talking about your stuff um so there's two things I want to ask you about. I don't know. Okay. If I don't know if you can talk about both of them. But um, uh, um, is it Muay Thai University or Thai University? No, it's Thai Boxing University. Thai Boxing University. Thai Boxing University dot com. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So what happened was when uh, COVID hit, I had this idea, this concept in my mind um, to develop uh, the largest informational website on instructional Muay Thai. Okay. okay, so people could go there and they could, you know, they'd have a library. But obviously, it takes time to de develop that stuff. And I bought that, ThaiBoxingUniversity.com, that uh, I bought that domain name in, man, it was a long time ago. It was probably like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in an airport, in fact. Mm -hmm. And I go, man, that would be a pretty cool name. Because I teach at the university, university is always in my head, you know. Right. Yeah. I've been teaching at Cornell, by the way, for 28 years. Wow. Yes. Jeez. Yeah. Teaching Jeet Kune Do at Cornell University. <laughs> oh, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta tell you something. I gotta tell you something. So when I started thinking about talking to you this Friday, I coined a new phrase. Oh, great. Yes. Right. Because I, I was like, yeah, um, something is something, and then I go, oh yeah, well, yeah, that's because he is um, uh, tertiarily educated. <laughs> Enlighten me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, see, because so in the British educational system, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Right. Right? 
So I came up with this phrase, a person who, it's just a fancy way of saying, oh, he went to college. Yeah. He's, tertiarily, awesome. <laughs> right? He's tertiarily educated. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I, I'm really happy that I've been able to, to influence so many people through the university system and teach Kali and, and you know, Muay Thai. I started with Muay Thai. Mm -hmm. I started in 1992 teaching Muay Thai there. And, you know, I, I, I just couldn't give it up. It's just phenomenal. I mean, I get a fresh new group of people. I get them for uh, some of them for four years. Mm -hmm. They're excited to learn. Um, you know, so I, I really love my job there. Uh, but when, when COVID hit, they closed it, they cut the classes off and they sent everybody home. Yeah. And I go, okay, what am I going to do? I can't sit home. I got to do something. I have to, I have a project. I need a project. Right. And so I grabbed my notes and I started putting together things and I put together a format and I grabbed my phone and I had like a little selfie, cheapy selfie uh, apparatus to hold my phone. I took that off. I put it on my tripod. I went down to my buddy's gym. It was a private gym. Nobody could go there except him. And I set up and I started teaching. And I just taught all the best material I could remember, mm -hmm. you know, foundationally. Like uh, now I have about 84 videos on the on the site okay and th there's a free site and then there's a subscription site the subscription's 99 dollars a year okay. and you know full access and i'm constantly i just put something on there last week some of the videos are 40 minutes mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of information on there but that's what the i have to do stuff yeah i can't sit at home yeah. i can't watch tv i can't do that kind of this is, that life this is why this is why i love admire and envy you all at the same time. Um, probably more than 10 years ago, I bought the domain jikondodrills.com. I'm Very done cool. with it. <laughs> 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 right? Well, you know. I wouldn't put yourself down. You are uh, definitely not a low achiever. <laughs> you are. Very, you're very kind. In the light. Uh, every time I train with you, I have such a great time and I just, when I see you, I'm like, oh man, Dwight's here. <laughs> you know, I'm so excited to see you, you know, because yeah. we've sat in the airport and talked. We've done, you know, so many times we've interacted and um, through the years. And I really enjoy your personality. I, I think that that's one of the most amazing things about you. Uh, and so it's, it's just a gift for me to, to be able to well, communicate. Yeah. If, if if this wasn't my tone, I'd blush, but uh, you know, <laughs> nobody would know. Um, but it, um, Coase uh, Falkins, who's on here, he he said he said to me today, he goes, "Wow, you got Kevin at one o'clock, and then you got Mick Tully at six o'clock. You're you're busy." And it just snapped out of my brain. Well, I love this. I love right. doing this. Yeah, you know, th this is th this to I. Fridays are my favorite day of the week now because I'm going to get to sit and talk martial arts mm -hmm. with somebody, you know, it's either somebody that I know really well, somebody I know only a little bit or somebody that I might be meeting for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and no matter who it is, it's, I have never thought in turn, I've never had the, the highfalutin um, thoughts about, being of service. I never really thought in that way. And then I realized that, well, this is service. I mean, we're teachers. Absolutely. You, you know, and this is an aspect of the teaching. Because people are going to hear you talk about your struggles and how you've developed things, and they're going to learn from that. And I, to me, it's just fun. Oh, it is fun. You know, to and you know, one of the, the greatest things I ever heard was somebody told me that if I'm going to, he goes, I'm going to tell you a secret. This guy, I used to play chess with him. He taught me how to play chess. He was one of my neighbors. And he says, I'm going to tell you a secret. Because I asked him, I go, what do you do? You're always home. And he goes, oh, I have a very unique job. And I never really understood it. But he said, I'm going to tell you a secret. If you can find out 
what you do really, really well and get really good at. I think his phone died. Hang on, guys. Hopefully we can get him back. Maybe he wasn't supposed to reveal that secret, huh? All right. Okay. Um, let me try to fill in while we get Kevin back. Um, so you just heard me say that at 6 p.m. we'll be back on with uh, Mick Tully, right? Yeah, that was you. And it happened right as you said, I'm oh. going to tell you a secret. It happened. And that's on my computer. So nothing, It's it, the network failed. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to tell you a secret. He said, if you find out what you're really good at and then get even better at it, and then find out a way to make a living, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And at the time I'm like, that's just, that's lame, you know? What kind of secret is that? Because I'm a kid, you know? But I always remembered that. And I, I didn't truly understand it until later on when my dad, I found out that my dad really hated his job. Mm -hmm. And all, all through my life growing up, my dad hated going to work, he hated his job. And what he really wanted to be uh, he did after he retired, and that was he wanted to be a forest ranger. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Wow. Uh, he was a computer engineer. He used to back in the day when Burroughs and IBM were the only competition, and yeah. he worked as a field repairman. He'd take me to places like uh, Hughes Aircraft and Coca Cola, and we'd walk into this giant room and he'd go, "This is the computer." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It was probably like, you know, 200 megabytes. <laughs> is he still alive? My dad is, is no longer with us. He's in my heart, of course. And, uh, okay. did he, yeah. did, but was he able to see advancements in computer engineering? Oh, absolutely. As yeah. a matter of fact, when I got my, um, my Power Mac and I'd finally outgrown it, I boxed it up and I sent it to him. <laughs> and, he, and my mom said he, he sat and he looked at it. For about 20 minutes, he looked at the box and he didn't open it. And then he finally opened it and he goes, I don't want this. He, he called me, he goes, what did you send me that for? I don't want that. I go, oh, come on, come on, just, I think you'll like it. And he's like, I don't want it. And then about four months later, he goes, would you feel bad if I got rid of your computer and I bought a laptop? Because <laughs> I think it was only a, you know, I mean, it was a really, at the time, it was the fastest computer when I bought it at that time period, but it was, you know, silly. It was not even a gigabyte, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The entire hard drive. <laughs> uh, um, okay, the second thing, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Okay. Uh, the podcast. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just, I, I was talking to Dwight earlier and I just put one in the can. I, I decided to start this podcast. Uh, my wife, Donna is a great uh, influence and motivator for me. She's the most wonderful thing that's happened to me in my life. And uh, she said, you need to do a podcast. And uh, so I had to come up with a name. I had to come up with, because that's how I am. I have to develop the entire thing. I have to do the artwork. I have to find the music. I have to do the intro. I have to edit it. I have to load it. I have to do it all. Okay, because that's how, that's kind of my thing, you know. Um, and so it's called Mindcast. And it's going to be on mental performance. It's going to be the, the uh, best strategies that I've found for improving yourself and improving your life and your and your results. And I got the first one in the can today, this morning. I worked on it for three hours editing it and then get it all ready to go. And it will be showing up within the next couple of days. Uh, I want to get two of them at least. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to continually do that. But it's called Mindcast with Kevin Seaman. All right. Yeah. OK. All right. And I, I like where it's going. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. I like to keep them at about 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, just that's my personal thing. I heard one time about uh, TED Talks that they, they don't go any longer than 18 minutes because right. that's really what they found worked. Yeah. And I go, oh, I think that's a good. Yeah. I'm going to learn from the best. 
yeah, that, that's what I that's what I try to do with the broadcast on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I'm going to talk to the camera, then it'll it'll just be you know I don't want people looking at this face too long. I didn't even shave today. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, here here we are. We're dragging right through the you know. <laughs> I doubt if anybody that started is still with us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you they know, are, they have my eternal death. Right, yeah, too bad, too bad for them. Um, all right, so people who want to get in touch with you, what's the best place to find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, obviously, um, and you can contact me at Kevin at the winning mindset .com. All right. Yep. And like I said, people, just go, go to the website and just read that front page. And if that doesn't motivate you to get off your butt, I don't, I don't know what will. Oh, thank you so much. All right. And I, and I am going to release a new book uh, this year. And it might be around the, the first of the year uh, called How to Hack Your Own Mind. Nice. Right now, it's been a digital program that I've, that I've, uh, I tested. Yeah. And I'll, as you know, a lot of my stuff is interactive. Right. You know, to yeah. me, that's what it's all about. It's not about the book. It's not about me. It's about you. And it's about you learning more about yourself so you can you know, grab the wheel and, uh, and take yourself up the high road. There you go, man. All right. Listen, my friend, thank you so much for doing this. It's, a, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Dwight. All right. Okay. So we'll talk, we'll talk again. All right. Okay. okay. Thank Ready? you. Thank you. All righty. That was episode number 155 of the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues with uh, Kevin Seaman. So you guys feel free, share, like, comment, ask questions. I'll ask Kevin to go through the uh, comments and see if there's anything he or I need to answer specifically. Follow me on Twitter at Dwight Woods and on Instagram at Dwight D. Woods. Uh, I love JeetKune the Quick Skills Series Volume 1, still available. Coming up in just a few hours at 6 p.m., we'll be back with episode 156 with uh, Mick Tully. So I will see some of you guys, I hope, in just a little bit. Uh, otherwise, I'll see some of you next week when we do the I Love Jeet Kune Do broadcast. Until then, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, signing off. You guys enjoy your weekend and uh, see you soon. Talk soon. Take care.